Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this afternoon, um, I will actually be covering the taxation aspects of Labuan and uh, to share with you um, what we have been doing uh, with some of our clients, uh, how we structure things using Labuan. Uh, so at least it gives you a flavour of how things are done. Um, I'll cover the taxation system in Labuan. I'll cover a little bit about the double tax agreements and uh, how Labuan can be used in ASEAN, for example. And last but not least, I'll give you examples of some transactions that we have seen uh, uh, where Labuan is being used. Okay? So please feel free to ask me any questions. Stop me during the presentation. Um, ask me any questions. I'll be most happy to, to uh, try and answer them. Or you can always ask uh, the questions towards the end of the presentation. So, um, as the previous speaker has also mentioned, um, obviously, um, Labuan entities have got a separate tax regime. In Malaysia, we have the Income Tax Act 1967, but for Labuan, there's a special tax regime called the uh, Labuan Business Activity Tax Act that was actually uh, enacted in 1990. And the tax system is meant to be a preferential tax system where if you set up a Labuan company to do Labuan business activities, you'll be given uh, a preferential tax regime, something like a tax incentive. Um, I'll cover that in a little bit more detail, how exactly it works. Um, but basically, if a Labuan company is doing trading activities, that it will include uh, more active activities such as banking, insurance, management, licensing, shipping activity. Um, that is given tax of 3% or 20,000, and I'll, I'll go through in a little bit more detail later. And for those Labuan companies that are conducting non-trading activity, in other words, more passive type of uh, uh, activities such as holding of investments like stocks, securities and shares, then basically the tax uh, rate is zero. Okay? So uh, this preferential tax regime uh, is covered under this act that I've mentioned just now, Labuan Business Activity Tax Act. Um, 3% 20,000 is for trading activities and I mentioned uh, zero is for non-trading activity and if a Labuan company is doing both, in other words, uh, it's doing trading activities but it also holds investments, then everything is lumped into trading, all right? But whatever it is, uh, the tax can be limited to 20,000 ringgit. Now, this is just a summary. So non-trading, there's no tax at all. So some examples of what uh, non-trading would be would be, for example, if you set up a mutual fund in Labuan or a unit trust or a fund, uh, it could be a PE fund, for example, uh, and all the fund does is hold investments, then basically uh, we've argued that uh, it is conducting non-trading and is zero tax. And that has been the case for many, many years, and the tax authorities have not argued otherwise. All right? So most funds um, have been set up in Labuan and uh, are not subject to tax. And currently, there are about 60-odd funds in Labuan. Uh, some of them are Sharia-based Islamic funds. Some of them are conventional funds. You know? So we've seen a lot of funds like infrastructure funds. We've seen uh, PE funds uh, involved in regional investments. Um, and uh, some of these funds could invest back into Malaysia as well. That's allowed. Um, trading would be more active activities, uh, leasing, banking, insurance and trading. Uh, so basically, it's 3% of net profits per audited account. So uh, when you pay 3%, you will of course need to have audited accounts because that 3% is levied upon your P&L profits. Okay? Now, we have some clients that say that uh, they would still prefer to pay 3% because back in head office, for example, in France, their tax authorities would only recognise tax if it's a percentage, right? So let's say French companies generally would pay 3% and they will not elect 20,000. But a lot of other clients generally will just elect to pay 20,000 because it's fairly easy. You don't need to have audited accounts. It's a very sim simple process of filling up a form. And that election is available on a yearly basis. So what happens is on a year-by-year -year basis, you can then choose uh, whether you want to pay the 20,000 or you want to stick to the 3%. Okay? Um, now, if a company in Labuan were to do what we call non-Labuan business activities, then obviously the tax will be our Malaysian domestic tax rate of 24%. Now, what are some of the examples of non-Labuan business activities? This would normally be coming back into Malaysia. So you set up a company in Malaysia and you come back into Malaysia 
Maybe you sell certain things to Malaysian or you provide services to Malaysian domestically, then obviously that is non Labuan business activity. All right? um, however, there are some concessions. If you're a Labuan bank, Labuan insurance company, or Labuan leasing company, then you are even allowed to come back into Malaysia. All right? So apart from these three general industries, most other Labuan companies are not allowed to come back into Malaysia other than for investments in stocks and shares. Because right? otherwise, a lot of people will just set up a company in Labuan and come back to Malaysia and not pay the 24% tax. Yeah? Any question? Yes. Uh, if you are engaged in a business where you're trading chemicals, let's assume imports and exports, does that come under Labuan trading? Yes. So it's 3% tax? Yes, that, that does. So long as you don't sell back to Malaysia. Yeah, so if you're, uh, so if it's used just as a hub, yeah. uh, you're, let's hypothetically say, uh, buying from China, selling to some other parts of the world. Yeah, so that, that should come yeah. under the trading activity, and that should be 3%, or you could elect 20,000. And the directors and shareholders of this company can be based anywhere? Yeah, I think generally you can, uh, but obviously, yeah, you, you can, uh, but obviously, um, you know what's happening around the world uh, with BAPs and all that sort of stuff. If you want to create substance in Labuan, then it's advisable to have some form of substance in Labuan as well. Yeah, you may, for example, want to uh, hire a local director sure. yeah, and uh, have a bank account uh, in Labuan. Um, I think some of the trust companies that you see here today will be able to advise you further and even be able to provide the substance to you. Yes, yes, there are 50 over almost 60 banks. So the Citibanks, the HSBCs, the Standard Charters, and the JP Morgans, and all that, they are all in Labuan. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, so again, a summary. I think the main thing I just wanted to mention here is if you are a trading company and you also make investments uh, into various types of stocks and shares then some people will say, I've made capital gains when I sell those investments. How do I tax it? Now, if you're a bank or if you're a stockbroking company, obviously capital gains will be reflected as part of net profits and therefore it's just going to be taxed at 3% or limited to 20,000. 20, I would say that majority of the companies in Labuan, if they're profitable, they would choose to pay the 20,000 ringgit. Yeah? And it makes sense, right? Uh, of course, if your Labuan company is making investments into a property in Malaysia, right, that you can't run away from taxes. You will have to pay our Malaysian real property gains tax. And everyone, whether it's a Labuan company, Malaysian company, or you could be an investor from the UK or US, so long as you invest in land and buildings in Malaysia, you will have to pay real property gains tax. Okay? That, there's there's no, um, not many uh, uh, structuring out of that. Now, on top of that, uh, Labuan has also the ability for people to pay zakat. We do have some Islamic finance players that tell us that they're very used to paying zakat back in the Middle East, um, and as such, there's a preference to pay zakat. Then what happens? Will they then have to pay double taxes? In other words, pay, pay zakat as well as pay the taxes. Uh, so what uh, the government has done is to say that any zakat paid can be netted off against the tax due. So in other words, you don't double pay. All right? Uh, uh, but I think from experience, most companies will just pay the taxes in Labuan without paying zakat at all. Yeah? Now, what other exemptions are there? Um, I think the previous uh, speaker has mentioned quite a bit of those, but I'll just focus on the main ones. I think stamp duty, stamp duty um, Malaysia's law has got uh, very similar stamp duty provisions to the UK, UK legislation. Uh, so, for example, in Malaysia, if you were to transfer shares, you're talking about, you know, a 0.3% stamp duty. Um, if you're transferring certain assets, it may be 3%. But when it comes to Labuan, all instruments relating to the business activities will be exempted from stamp duty. And even the buying and selling of shares in a Labuan company or Labuan entity is also exempted from stamp duty. So generally, in Labuan, there shouldn't be any stamp duty payable. Okay, and it's a pretty good incentive. Um, on top of that, Labuan enjoys free port status, so there is no sales tax, no service tax, no custom duties at all. In fact, when you go to Labuan, certain things are actually cheaper, yeah, because of the uh, no, no, no taxes over there. 
Um, unfortunately, effective from 1st of April, we have this new tax called the GST. I think those living in Singapore are very used to it. You probably have had GST for about 20 years now. But for us, it's a very new tax and everyone's grumbling about it. Um, generally, in Labuan, there is no GST. So if a Labuan company, your, your example, you were to buy from China and sell to another country, there is actually no GST. However, if the Labuan company were to buy from China and sells to Malaysia, then obviously there will be GST. Yeah? So the GST is only applicable once you touch domestic Malaysia. Offshore. Yeah, yeah. Because if you look at the history of Labuan, the intention was for, for, for it to be offshore. And if you compare to a lot of jurisdictions out there, a lot of offshore centres, we've done a comparison, even for countries like Mauritius, right, where it's got a similar system to Labuan, a low tax system, um, once you hit onshore, they will also tax you at a higher rate. Yeah? Because it's, it's a tax leakage, you see? Yeah? Okay? Um, filing, a lot of people are asking us, what is the filing? Uh, is it easy to do? I would say it's extremely easy. Uh, for those Labuan entities which are non-trading, in other words, you pay zero taxes. It's just a statutory declaration, a Form 6 that you have to fill out every year. Um, if you're carrying on trading activity, in other words, you pay 3%, then it's just a matter of filling out uh, some forms as well. Very, very straightforward. One of the forms will be just one page. Or alternatively, you can elect to pay 20000 fill out another form, and then just pay the tax of uh, 20000 through a cheque. When do you file the tax returns? Normally, it's three months from year end. So if your year end is 31st of December, you will file your tax return by the 31st of March, but an automatic extension is given up to May every year. Okay? Fairly straightforward process. What are some of the other exemptions? I think one thing important to note here is there are also exemptions for withholding tax. So in other words, if your Labuan entity were to pay dividends, royalties, interest or technical fees to non-residents or other Labuan companies, there are actually no withholding tax. Under Malaysia's normal legislation, there's a withholding tax of 10 or 15%. I think most countries will have withholding taxes. But for Labuan, the withholding tax has been exempted. Now, if a Labuan entity decides to pay lease payments to someone else, to a foreigner, there's also exemption of the withholding tax. So essentially, the Labuan entity can make payment to various people outside the country or to another Labuan company without paying any withholding tax at all. So another good incentive where, uh, 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 because of that, I think a lot of people have considered Labuan. Now the question then is what about a Malaysian payer? If a Malaysian resident were to con contract and do certain activities with a Labuan bank, what happens? Based on the legislation, there's also no withholding tax if a Malaysian payer were to pay a Labuan bank. So specific situations, even a Malaysian payer making payment to Labuan entities, there wouldn't be any withholding tax. Okay, now double tax agreement, I just wanted to mention that currently, Malaysia has 80 double tax agreements in force. It's quite a lot of double tax agreements. Um, and Labuan generally enjoys the double tax agreement that Malaysia has, with the exception of 14 countries. Now, these 14 countries I've noted out here have specifically excluded Labuan in the double tax agreements with Malaysia. Um, and, uh, but what is important to note here is that ASEAN countries generally have not excluded Labuan. Yeah? And that's why the government has also said that if you do want to access these double tax agreements, you could perhaps elect the Labuan company elect to pay taxes under the local income tax regime and you would still qualify for the double tax agreement. Because the double tax agreement basically does not exclude Labuan, it just excludes a Labuan company paying taxes under the Labuan Business Activity Tax Act. So you can still elect to pay tax under the Income Tax Act 1967, and qualify for the double tax agreement. And because Malaysia's tax system is very similar to Singapore and Hong Kong, if the Labuan company elects to pay taxes under the Income Tax Act, and all it does is just hold investments overseas, there's also no tax in Malaysia. You know, so a lot of people get the wrong impression that if I elect to pay taxes under the Income Tax Act, I will have a problem. It is not really a problem if all you're doing is something passive, holding investments. 
there's actually no tax at all, even under the domestic Malaysian regime. Certificate of tax residency. So quite a lot of our clients have said that um, I want to access, access tax treaty uh, or for whatever reason, I want to prove that I am a resident in Labuan. Um, then the question they have is, how do I get a certificate of tax residency? Again, it's a fairly uh, easy and straightforward process. Um, you just have to write in to our tax authorities and prove that you have some form of substance or residency in Malaysia or Labuan. And that normally includes the board of meetings, proving that board directors' meetings are held in Malaysia. Um, and some of these meetings obviously have to be uh, related to important decision-making. Yeah? Um, some other things that sometimes the tax authorities will ask for is, well, do you have a bank account in Malaysia? Yeah, they want to see that. Obviously, the more things you have, like an office, like a trust company could give you a, a resident director, that helps a lot. And the tax residency certificate is given for one year. All right? So it's a year-to-year -year basis uh, that they provide you with a tax residency certificate. And it's a fairly easy and straightforward process. Normally, it will take maybe about two weeks to four weeks to get that uh, certificate. So what are some of the countries? When we look at Vietnam, um, Malaysia has got the tax treaty uh, where you know, uh, the tax treaty doesn't really reduce. Um, you know, and most countries don't do that anyway. So Vietnam is, is, Malaysia's treaties with Vietnam is not worse off than whatever it's got. Uh, Thailand, the treaty rates are actually better than uh, the non-treaty rates. For example, interest is 10%. Um, with uh, Myanmar, the treaty rates are also slightly better, 10% here for interest and 10% here for royalties. And uh, capital gains is actually quite good. There's no withholding tax generally uh, if you were to invest in Myanmar via Malaysia and sell the investments because the treaty with Myanmar actually says that um, you do not have to pay um, any taxes in Myanmar compared to the non-treaty rates of 10%. With uh, Cambodia, uh, we don't have a double tax agreement with Cambodia. I think that's a work in progress. With Brunei, again, the treaty is uh, fairly good. Um, interest withholding tax can be reduced to 0 or 10%. There are, of course, conditions for the 0% compared to the treaty rates of 15%. Um, and um, with Laos, again... Dividend withholding tax can be reduced to 5% compared to the non-treaty rate of 10. And even interest potentially can even reduce to zero depending on the conditions as well. Okay, so from here you can see that if you want to make investments into ASEAN, um, obviously Labuan is something that you can consider because uh, Labuan should be able to take advantage of the tax treaty uh, that Malaysia has. Uh, with these countries in ASEAN, and uh, so far, I think with, when it comes to Asian countries and ASEAN, uh, most of them have not um, uh, sort of like um, uh, taken Labuan out of the tax treaties at all. Now, some examples of uh, what Labuan has been used for, some of the bigger transactions. Um, obviously, it's in wealth and fund management, fairly popular. Uh, where a lot of the fund managers uh, could be sitting in Malaysia, could be sitting in Hong Kong and other countries, have actually structured um, funds in Labuan yeah, for making of various investments. And the fund manager may be sitting in Labuan itself or could be sitting, for example, in Kuala Lumpur or other countries. And normally what we would look for is a lower tax jurisdiction for the fund where possible, we want a reduction in the taxes when it comes to the investments in the various countries, right? So tax treaties could come in, or we may interpose other com companies in other jurisdictions. Uh, and of course, this entity here must be able to remit investment returns to the investors without any further taxes. And of course, if the fund manager has got some form of incentives, that would be a plus factor as well. So when you look at some of these things that a lot of our clients ask for, um, you find that, you know, Labuan, for example, um, we've got certain transactions such as having a holding company in Labuan, holding various types of assets and properties. Um, you could have a trustee 
yeah, holding the shares on behalf of beneficiaries. And as you know, if you're a fund in Labuan, it's basically zero taxes. And if you're a fund manager in Labuan, it's either 3% or maximum 20,000. You can elect for that. Um, so here, I've just said, yeah, non-trading for Labuan. No withholding tax at all when you make distributions to investors. And of course, the Labuan fund manager is taxed at 3% or 20,000. And uh, depending on where you invest in, potentially you could also have a reduction in the uh, foreign uh, withholding taxes from various countries. So in that sense, that's why we've seen uh, the growth in uh, wealth management, or we're starting to see the growth in wealth management. Um, quite popular with uh, the Middle East. Middle East, uh, because um, I think we've got quite a few Middle Eastern banks in Malaysia, uh, and uh, they have actually... Um, um, been using Labuan for some of their uh, Islamic funds, for example. So we look at insurance, and we also try to compare Labuan with very popular locations like Bermuda and Guernsey. Um, and you find that you know, the tax system in Bermuda and Guernsey is basically zero taxes. Yeah? No capital gains taxes, no withholding tax, no goods and services tax, um, generally no stamp duty, um, unfortunately, no double tax agreements here, a few here. So when we look at Labuan, it's pretty comparable to those uh, uh, jurisdictions that are popular with insurance because, well, slightly higher, 20,000 versus um, zero taxes here, but 20,000 is basically very low. It's only about 5,000 US. Yeah? Um, no capital gains tax, no withholding tax, and GST, generally no GST unless you're transacting with Malaysian residents. Um, exemption supply for stamp duty, and the good thing is we've got the double tax agreements. So generally because of that, what we're seeing is that uh, Labuan has also been used for reinsurance, it's also been used for captive insurance, yeah? and that is, there is actually a growth there. Um, I think we've got quite a lot of uh, Labuan insurance and reinsurance companies in, in, the, uh, in Labuan. 200 plus. Yeah, 200 plus. Yeah. So when we compare, yeah, generally, whichever country that pays premiums up to the captive or reinsurance company, there's no withholding tax. Um, the tax here can be limited to 20,000. And whatever returns back to investors, there's no withholding tax. Whereas Bermuda and Guernsey, very similar as well. So we had actually a client um, that's a very large insurance company that uh, European base have decided to set up something in Asia and they got one of my uh, colleagues in the insurance industry to actually do a survey and study for them comparing various jurisdictions in Asia and obviously Labuan is one of them and in the end they decided to uh, pick Labuan and they've set up uh, the reinsurance company in Labuan. Okay, and that was, I think, one or two years ago. So that's another area that's quite popular in Labuan. Leasing is another fairly popular structure happening in Labuan, uh, where you could have a Labuan lessor, right, that leases the um, aircraft, for example, is quite popular. Vessels are another popular item that's being leased out of Labuan. So you may be leasing it to the uh, lessee, uh, the Labuan lessor may actually own the aircraft or own the vessel and leases it to the lessee or alternatively, the Labuan entity may actually get into a master head lease from someone else in another country um, and then subleases it to the lessee. And this lessee could be sitting in a jurisdiction uh, somewhere or it could even be in Malaysia because you know, the Labuan lessor is allowed to transact with Malaysian residents. Um, and this structure has been very popular. Uh, you've got about 200 over leasing companies as well in Labuan. So um, people like, for example, AirAsia, um, Firefly, um, quite a, a few of the uh, oil and gas companies um, have been using Labuan leasing structures uh, for their, for their um, um, assets. And then we compare ourselves, you know, the most popular uh, leasing Jurisdiction obviously is in Ireland. So Ireland has this what we call the Section 110 leasing vehicle, uh, where whatever leases being received, right, is technically subjected to a 25% Irish tax, 
but there is actually a profit participation in interest payments that you can net off. So you're being taxed at 25% on a very low margin. So essentially, it's almost zero. And uh, that money goes up without any Irish withholding tax. So when we compare ourselves in Labuan with Ireland, you will see that actually, again, it's fairly comparable. So in that sense, that's why uh, quite a few people have done transactions through Labuan. Um, and uh, you know, and uh, it's, it's uh, quite a popular structure. Um, in fact, combining leasing transactions and Islamic finance, about five to six years ago, um, one of the Japanese banks actually restructured their existing lease uh, with a Hungarian airline company, um, tried to make it um, into a sukuk transaction. So what they did was set up a Labuan company that issued sukuks or Islamic bonds to refinance the uh, aircraft that they purchased from another leasing vehicle um, and uh, did a leasing structure which is on the back of an Islamic finance. Yeah? So that's, that's been done. We've also had a situation for the past one year or so uh, where a lot of Chinese companies are also starting to get into leasing via Labuan. Uh, some of these could be leasing, some of these could be trading of assets. So uh, at least 10, 10 to 12 transactions of uh, 10 to 12 companies, in fact, uh, in Labuan that has been set up to actually buy and sell uh, aircrafts from Chinese companies. So that's been fairly popular as well. Islamic finance, another example uh, where Labuan has been used for. Um, commodity murabaha is a structure where you buy and sell certain commodities. Uh, these commodities could be sitting in Australia, it could be wheat, uh, it could be iron, uh, it could, for example, be um, palm oil. Yeah, so we have got all these brokers uh, that get involved in this business, where the Labuan Bank or SPV will actually buy and sell the commodities, and as a result of the commodity transaction, uh, the, the financing is provided uh, to, the, to the end um, uh, purchaser. So again, another very popular structure, partly because... Um, the Middle Eastern Islamic Sharia experts feel that this is a structure that they accept compared to some of the transactions that Malaysia has done in the past, which is the buy and sell, which uh, 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 buying something and selling it back at a certain higher value, they feel that that has interest element. So this is a structure which has been passed by the Middle Eastern investors. So this is something fairly popular lately, uh, which some of the Labuan banks and even the Sukuk issuances have been based on this structure. So um, that's an example of some transactions that have happened through Labuan. Um, Suko issuance is another one that is fairly popular, uh, where the Labuan SPV is set up to issue Islamic bonds. Um, and it could be a ijara structure or a sale and leaseback structure, where the originator could be sitting in one country or even in Malaysia. Um, with the asset where they uh, sell and uh, lease back the structure. So this has been done uh, quite a bit of times. Uh, for example, people like Kazana, Malaysia Airlines, and even some of the uh, Japanese banks have actually done this transaction. Okay? So these are just some of the examples that I can share with you. Um, and uh, it's, it's fairly popular in the sense that uh, some of our clients have actually looked at uh, some of these uh, transactions and have done it, quite a few of these over the years. Okay, any, any questions? Uh, from the jurisdiction, it's always uh, it's quite usual Cayman Islands. So how does it uh, compare with the Labuan? Yeah, so I would say um, if you look at the structure, you could have a Cayman Island fund here and you could also have a Cayman fund manager here. Uh, a very popular structure, I admit. Uh, we have also done quite a few of these in the past. Um, it can be done. Cayman Island is basically zero taxes, and the fund manager will also be tax zero, right? So in that sense, it's quite tax efficient. But I think the thing with Cayman Island is it's very far away, right? So whenever we structure these sort of uh, structures for our clients, we will tell them that... Um, you have a fund in Cayman, you have a fund manager in Cayman, you have no office there, you have no people there, um, you need to have some form of substance these days. 
And you find with the Padamba papers and BAPs and all those discussions, um, a lot of people are getting very nervous about the tax authorities around the world and what they will do. So um, if you're a large company, you obviously want to make sure that you have substance, right? To make sure that uh, you have some form of substance in a Cayman Island uh, so that if the tax authorities in, say, Singapore, Malaysia or other countries were to come and attack you, you can say that this is genuine, right? But the difficulty I have with this being in Cayman is that a lot of my clients, they are not so willing to have substance in Cayman because it's too far away. Or whenever I tell them, you've got to go there and go for your meetings there, a lot of our clients say, forget it, <laughs> right? I don't know, maybe it's, it's uh, Asians or Malaysians. I've had structures where even in Luxembourg and Netherlands, I tell my clients, you've got to fly there to go for the meetings, you know? And they say, forget it. I can't get my board of directors to go there. So I think the difficulty that we have is the distance. And sometimes the service provider in Cayman, you're talking about 12 hours difference, right? Um, getting up late at night just to call them and to talk to them, I think it's, it's also a, a tough thing as well. Um, obviously, obviously it works, but you know, there's the practicalities of it. So because of that, that's why we try and say, okay, if it's too difficult for the clients to do this, then maybe we can suggest uh, a centre that is nearer in Asia, same time zone, where you can just pick up the phone, call your service provider, you know, um, to provide certain things to you, tell them off, whatever it is, yeah. Um, it's easier to deal with them, yeah, on the same time zone. Also, trying to get people to uh, control and manage the company is easier. Uh, when we say substance, it's also easier. You can actually have the service provider providing you with an office or part of an office in Labuan, for example. Um, and you can have the directors, you know, it's nearby. It's just only an hour or two hours to fly and, and speak to them. Um, and uh, the control and management is easier because you can actually go for the meetings. And control and management, just to share with you, it doesn't mean that the directors' meetings have to be in Labuan. It can also be in Kuala Lumpur, for example then you can have control and management as well. So I think it's, 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 it's more the ease of, of trying to have that substance. And how easy is it to transfer from Cayman to Labuan? Um, I believe uh, Labuan has a transfer of domicile provisions. So, so long as Cayman allows the transfer and Labuan accepts, then it can be done. We have actually done that before, many, many years back, during the very first... Uh, Asian financial crisis in the 1990s, uh, we had a, a very large group of uh, companies, they actually transferred domicile um, to Labuan. Yeah, I think so long as Cayman authority says okay, and the Labuan authority says okay as well, um, it can be quite easily done. Yeah. And any other questions? That you mentioned about the Panama Papers, the leak, um, how would that affect Labuan in general? Like, because there's also an off offshore jurisdiction. Labuan is a midshore jurisdiction. Because I have some clients who uh, you know, approach us and they're like, okay, what's the difference between Labuan and the other jurisdictions, for example, right? Labuan also has to pay 3% tax and stuff like that. So mm. what's your view on that? Mm. Um, I, I think, you know, as far as Labuan is concerned, it's, it's a midshore um, um, center. Um, obviously, the, the hype around Panama Papers is, is there, um, and obviously, it's, it's something that is uh, happening right now. So I think it, it, will, it will take time uh, to, to be resolved. But um, again, I think maybe the best people to answer this will be the regulators. I believe Labuan has actually signed, <laughs> has actually signed some uh, uh, transparency provisions, right? Yeah? Uh, lady at the end. <laughs> no, I think I did say in my, uh, in my remarks just now that, uh, yes, I mean, there is a heightened demand for transparency and, and exchange of information. Uh, but I think uh, at, the most important thing is this, whether you are committed to do that or not. I think OECD have all these requirements, right? And like I say, uh, say just now, Malaysia is committed to, to all these requirements. Uh, everywhere is the same. I mean, uh, if you talk about Cayman, you talk about BBI, everyone has to do the same thing. Uh, I, I guess uh, in this world now, uh, there's no such thing as secrecy. Except for US. Oh, except for US. Okay, unless you want to set up in US. 
but uh, don't quote me, nah. quote uh, David. That one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but the issue is uh, whether you are willing to comply with all these requirements. I think OCD is coming out with a list of all these so-called uncooperative uh, jurisdiction. Uh, so because we are committed to do it, uh, we have also been accessed under the peer review, under this OECD uh, assessment. Uh, I think we will come up pretty good uh, out of that. I hope so, anyway. I, I think we will come up pretty good. Uh, because we are committed to all these uh, so-called requirements on exchange of information and higher transparency. Uh, thing. I mean, uh, every, every jurisdiction will now have to undergo this uh, automatic exchange of information and also this CRS, they call it mm. country reporting system. You can't escape from that. So it's a matter of whether you want to create substance. Uh, and substance, like, like, like I think Jennifer is always, we are trying to allude is, Labuan is so near to you. So I guess it's cheaper than other jurisdictions to set these so-called uh, requirements out of Labuan. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and I think substance is something you will find going forward, it becomes more and more important. Uh, you know, whichever jurisdiction is, even in Singapore or Hong Kong for that matter, yeah, substance will be, become a, a, a very important thing uh, that when you look at the uh, BAPS requirements, one of those items mentioned is substance. So I think the authorities in Labuan as well as Malaysia are well aware of these requirements. So um, obviously coming up with new guidelines to beef up um, you know, the robustness of a Labuan structure. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Jenny, for the insightful presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, we hope you found the session useful and informative.